All the things are bad. There are no good things. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt. But to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree We do the show live every Wednesday at 7pm Pacific right here on Twitch twitch.tv slash echoplex media if you'd like to support this project you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash echoplex or even better go to eplex.store cop some merch uh, pick up a monthly membership works just like patreon but your monthly memberships at eplex.store include uh, product discounts and exclusive products like right now our pride 2024 merch and through the 15th of this month actually is available only to our members and uh, you could get that cop that a little bit early some of it looks pretty great uh, I'm producer Dave. Uh, you can find me on Grinder. I won't be joined by HK for the main show uh, tonight. Uh, HK will be joining us during Red Light. HK blew his voice out at a concert or something last night, so I'm going to go ahead and give him the main show off. Um, it's an, it's fortunate for him, maybe I don't know, because we're doing a little tiny dancer Ben uh, talking to RFK Jr. Uh, this week, and uh, we're going to get right into it. It's not just a, a tragedy; it's a crime against the against the child because the child has an independent interest what 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 do you say to that the solution of having the state come in and um and dictate choices that you know that the woman is making is not uh that, that's not a good solution to me you don't, you don't believe that the child has an independent right to life for example at any point during the pregnancy you know, you and I all differ on that, and that's just a bad place where I differ. And I understand your position. I have tremendous respect for you. Why? Um, for you know, for and why does Ben have a giant ear that? like on a uh, on a thing in the background? Absolute moral clarity on that position, but I think it's more uh, nuanced and complex than that. Today, we're joined by a figure whose family legacy is etched into Democratic. Oh shit! JFK is on the show. History, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Oh, that was terrifying. He's known for his storied lineage, but for his own advocacy of indigenous land rights and the environment, public health, and political commentary. A lawyer by training, Kennedy has been at the forefront of the environmental movement and has worked on issues related to vaccines through his organization, Children's Health Defense. Born into the Kennedy dynasty. Worked on issues related to vaccines is an interesting way to frame it, little dancer Ben. 11 children of the late Democratic Senator Robert F. Kennedy and Ethel Kennedy. RFK Jr.'s early life was marked by personal and family tragedy, including the assassinations of his uncle, President John F. Kennedy, and his father, Senator Robert F. Kennedy. He's overcome personal struggles, including a battle with drug addiction and legal issues. However, Kennedy's resilience is evident, carving out his path and pursuing education. I mean, it helps when you're rich. Institutions ...like Harvard University and the University of Virginia, before dedicating his career to environmental advocacy and legal practice. Kennedy is known as a defender of the environment. His work has set environmental legal standards that continue to influence policy and advocacy. This commitment to environmental causes led him to prominent roles, including serving as senior attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council and president of the board for the Waterkeeper Alliance. 
Oh, are those, what do those organizations have to say about him now? In this presidential race. First running as a Democrat in the primaries, then shifting his bid in October 23 to run as an independent. Polling data as recently as April 10th, 2024, placed him at 8.5% against incumbent President Joe Biden and President Donald Trump, with Trump in the lead at 41.9% and Biden at 40.3%. This would make him the single most successful third-party candidate since Ross Perot. Today, we delve into RFK Jr.'s vision for America and his hope for the Democratic Party, discussing a range of topics from chronic disease to AI, culture and entitlements to foreign policy, and his position on abortion. Join us as we explore these critical issues with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., seeking insights into his campaign and what it represents for the future of American politics. Thanks, Ben. Love it's little lights. It's supposed to be like old timey. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate the time. Got to ask why there's an ear, like on well, a on a stand behind them, ear. like a sculpture of an ear. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's let's start by talking a little bit about you know, kind of the background stuff. So I mean, first of all, obviously you're Kennedy. What was it like growing up in the Kennedy family? Um. Well, I grew up. I you know I grew up. In, we have a large Irish Catholic family. I was very, very close knit. Um, my uh, and and very kind of um, uh, you know I had twenty nine cousins. My my grandfather and grandmother was uh, Joseph and Rose Kennedy. They had nine kids, including uh, my uncle. Uh, well, their, their eldest son was Joe Kennedy, who was killed during World War II. Their eldest daughter was Kathleen, who was killed in an aircraft a, uh, airplane crash immediately after the war. Um, Joe Kennedy was kind of the big hope for my grandfather. He was uh, his golden child, so and he really never recovered from that uh, death. Um, his his next child was John Kennedy, who became the first Irish Catholic president of the United States. Um, he, my father was the was uh, his brother's campaign manager and then his attorney general. Later, after my uncle was killed in '63, my father ran for Senate, became senator from New York, and was killed running for president in '68 in Los Angeles. Um, my other uncle. Joe, uh, Ted Kennedy was in the, one of the longest serving members of the United States Senate. He was in the Senate for over 50 years. He has more legislation uh, with his name on it than any senator in history. My aunt Eunice Shriver was the founder of Special Olympics. And so there was, a, um, we were raised kind of in a milieu of public service and politics, and it was sounds all like privilege to me. At the convention in 1960, as a six-year-old boy, um, and you know, I we were had front row seats on on everything that happened during that Camelot period. Uh, I I became my after my dad's death. In '68, I was my my, you know, my mom had 11 kids, so I had 10 siblings, and my family was at that point after my dad was killed. It was very chaotic. I began a 14-year experiment with drugs. That turned 14 year experiment with heroin. drugs. It's a weird I way got to say it. In 1928, and then became. Uh, one of the, I would say, the leading environmental lawyers and activists in the country. I uh, founded a, a, or co-founded a group that became Waterkeeper Alliance, that became the biggest water protection group in the world. And I mainly was uh, litigating against polluters. Um, and uh, in, I think, around 2015, I or 2016, I started a, another group called Children's Health Defense that focuses on uh, on children. It's an anti-vaccine group. It focuses on being an anti-vaccine group. Internet public health. So, you know, so, looking at, at you know the history of your family, obviously it's intertwined intimately with with Democratic Party politics. You're running as an independent. You're the the highest polling independent since Ross Perot in the race right now. So I think the obvious question for, for a lot of people is why aren't you running as a as a Democrat or more importantly, now that, that Joe Biden has wrapped up the nomination, why aren't you simply supporting Joe Biden for the presidency? 
Well, I began running as a Democrat. I, you know, the reason I ran is because I saw the Democratic Party, my country, but also the Democratic Party, departing from a lot of the values that I was raised with. What people call Kennedy Democrat um, Party. I, if my, I think if my father, my uncle, if you outlined their top 20 policy priorities that I would check the box for each one of them. Wait, what? Um, and, you know, I'm kind of a traditional Kennedy, a, a Democrat. What does that mean? Traditional liberal. I believe in free speech. I believe in the Constitution of the United States. I believe that corporations should not dominate our government. Um, my inclination is to be against war and very suspicious of um, of the rise of the military industrial complex. Um, I, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I think particularly um, re re reducing the, uh, the toxic exposures to our children. Right. <clears throat> like he's an environmentalist, like in so far as like toxins, not like, not like a climate change, uh, not a person terribly concerned with climate change, as far as I know the sustainability of our soils, uh, protecting water, clean air, all of those issues are Purple Mountains Majesty. Those were the centerpieces of my career. Um, environmental justice. The mountains turn purple. They're probably pretty polluted. This was a priority for the Democratic Party. Um, and, and personal freedom. And the, the party has... has uh, I think particularly since the Citizens United case in 2008, the, the party has become the party not of the middle class, which it was when I was growing up. It was the cops and the firefighters, factory workers. Yes, it has the cops, the, famously not uh, Republicans. The party of Wall Street and the party of pharma and the party of the military industrial complex. And when I ran, you know, I, I was really... I would say triggered to run during COVID when we saw all the censorship happen and democratic politicians. Yeah, he was like, oh shit, I could use my name to grift even harder. Speech in this country for the first time in our history. And, and uh, the support of the democratic party for the war in Ukraine, which I, um, I see as a contrived war. What? Um, and an immoral war. We're not and, at war. Uh, and that really prompted not me there, at least. to run. But I ran as a Democrat, and my intention was to try to call the Democratic Party back to its, to summons it back to its, uh, its core values. Uh, what I found was, and my campaign manager during the outset of the campaign was Dennis Kucinich, who's run for president a couple times himself. and was yeah, Dennis Kucinich famously uh, included the word chemtrails in a bill that he proposed. Kind of a, uh, the conscience of the Democratic Party, a core figure and and beloved figure for his integrity, for his um, you know for his courage. And he said from the beginning, they're not going to let you run in this party, and you're going to have to leave. And I was the last. They did let him run. He campaign. just talking. You just didn't get any votes. That, but the Democratic Party began taking all kinds of steps to make sure that no matter, even if I won the, the primaries, that I still could not win the nomination. They canceled primaries. They, no, they didn't. Um, they, they passed a rule that's just one of, of 60 different things they did. They passed a rule that any candidate who stepped into the state of New Hampshire during the election could not, uh, that all of those, uh, all of the delegates that that candidate won in New Hampshire would go to President Biden. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a number of, of uh, sort of transparent uh, uh, efforts to fix the election that came from the Democratic Party and um, that prompted all, all, prompted me ultimately to make the decision that if I wanted to make a serious run, that I had to leave the party. So I declared independent, and I, I forget, maybe three months, four months ago. And I've been running as an independent ever since. So, you know, that, that answers why you're not backing President Biden. But, you know, many of the issues on which you disagree with President Biden have a lot of crossover with, with President Trump, who obviously is running on the other side of the aisle. So 
you know, it, you're in a strange position where Democrats are suggesting that you're a President Trump plant in order to take votes away from Biden. Some members of the Trump camp are, are claiming that you're a Biden plant in order to take away votes from, from I, my President take Trump. is that if he's still in, he's going to take more votes from Trump than from Biden. Why not support President Trump as an alternative to to President Biden? Yeah, I, I um, see. I don't see it that way. I think that. President Biden and President Trump are much more like each other than most people. Um, and Democrats and Republicans like to acknowledge it. And, and, and let me say this, because that's going to be a controversial statement. I want to qualify it. I think um, President Trump and President Biden are very different in their temperaments and extremely different. They're different in their professed ideologies. They're different in the... Um, in their personalities and their and their rhetoric, um, but could we go with character too? Like they have different character. Like Joe Biden's not a perfect man, but his character seems to be better than that of uh, Donald Trump. Who's that they differ on are in a very very narrow band. They're mainly culture war issues. They're abortion. It's guns. The border. Um, you know, woke ideology. Those kind of transgender stuff. Some of them very, very important issues. You know, the border is the only one that I would say is even vaguely existential. Um, but uh, the the big issues at America that are existential to our country that really threaten all of us, that are most concerned to all of us, um, neither of them has even taken positions on the debt, for example. They're both equally bad on the debt. The debt is the, the most important issue. It's $34 trillion. Our, the, the service on that debt is now larger than our defense budget. And our defense budget is larger than the next 10 defense budgets for the next 10 countries in the world all put together. So uh, that is, and, and, you know, President Trump and President Biden are largely responsible individually for the, that debt. President what? Trump ran up the biggest debt in history. He, he ran up, he ran, he put $8 trillion on that number. And that is more than uh, all the presidents in 283 years of history before him. And President Biden put almost that much on it. So... Um, within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that is collected in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt within 10 years. And, and particularly if interest rates rise within 10 years. I like the weird monetary, um, modern monetary uh, theory people who are just like, I just mint a $16 trillion coin and deposit it. <laughs> I think those people are funny, but I'm, I mean, also it's kind of, why not? 100%. Of every dollar collected in taxes will go to servicing the debt. So this is a this is really an existential crisis for our country, and you don't hear President Biden or President Trump ever talk about it. And well, they I, have no solutions for I, it. I, I, I want to ask you about what what your solutions are to that because yeah, you know, we well, can talk about the defense budget, but the reality is two thirds of the American budget is entitlement programs that nobody wants to touch. Well, the the, the biggest. The biggest cost is um, our medical costs, and the medical costs are preventable. And you know, this goes to another issue, which neither of them ever talk about, which is the, which I believe is the biggest issue, which is the chronic disease, even bigger than the budget, the, which is existential, which is the chronic disease epidemic. When my uncle was president, six percent of Americans had chronic disease. Today, sixty percent have chronic disease. Oh, I'm not sure. Sixty percent. I mean, what do you mean by chronic disease, though? This is one of those things where one, the population is getting older, more people are going to be living with chronic disease, but also the diagnosis, the ability to diagnose chronic disease, has improved greatly since the '60s. And, um, and that more than any country in the world. I mean, one of the reasons we had during COVID, we had the highest death rate, the highest body count of any country in the world. We had 16% of the COVID deaths globally were in the United States. We only have 4.2% of the world's population. CDM, and a lot of that was mismanagement, but a lot of it was also because we have the highest chronic disease burden of any country in the world. The CDC says what that the, fuck? the average American who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic diseases. 
Now, you take these chronic diseases individually. Um, juvenile diabetes, when I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of juvenile diabetes in his lifetime, his entire career, 40 year career. Oh, yeah, because some of them would die. Today, one out of every three children who walk into his office is pre diabetic or diabetic. The call. Well, what does pre diabetic mean? I mean, anybody who eventually gets di- becomes diabetic is pre diabetic. What does he mean? One in three is pre diabetic. Lumping those together <clears throat> is dishonest. Most of diabetes now in this country is higher than the defense budget. One disease, and that doesn't even include Alzheimer's, which we now know, which has now been reclassified as uh, as di- type type three diabetes. Have they? They haven't decided that Alzheimer's is a type of diabetes, have they? I, Alzheimer's. I don't know for sure, but this sounds incorrect. Coming from the same cause that's causing the diabetes, which is food. It's a poison food. We have a- Oh, God, it's this fucking don't smoke weed out of a Coke can shit again, isn't it? Thousand ingredients in our food that are banned in Europe and other countries. And they're killing us, literally. The autism rate in our country has gone from one in 10,000 in my generation, 70 year old men, one in 10,000 has full blown autism. What does that even mean? In my kids' generation, it's one in every 34 kids, according. But that's different than, I don't even know what he means when he says full-blown autism, but he's com- comparing what he, whatever the fuck he means when he says full-blown autism to people who have been diagnosed with a, some type of autism spectrum disorder. Again, this is uh, dishonest. To CDC, one in every 22 boys. So um, this is a national security issue. It's a, the, the cost. Mark Black will just publish a peer review publication that shows that the cost of treating autism alone is a trillion dollars a year. So this is, like I say, this is existential for us. And then there, there's all these other disease that suddenly appeared around 1989 all these allergic diseases food allergies uh, yeah nobody was allergic to food before 1989 <laughs> all this allergy just showed up i don't know minding my own business in 1989 and all of a sudden people were allergic to shit come on this is stupid i fucking i i think it's some like is ben gonna because like i don't like ben shapiro I don't agree with his politics, but I think he's wrong about some stuff, but he does like occupy some version of, of a world that we all agree exists, right? Like he's, I don't think like, why is he going to say anything about this? Peanut allergies, eczema, um, asthma exploded. We had that early, you know, when I was a kid, there were, I, I knew people with asthma, but today they're in every classroom. There's albuterol and inhalers in every classroom. There's epipens in every classroom. Nobody's talking about this and explaining why the, the neurological disorders, ADD, ADHD, speech. As medicine gets better, these things. Okay, ADHD. I don't know. Uh, probably just better to, better uh, diagnosis of ADHD, right? Otherwise, before it was just your kid's brat. Um, but some of this stuff it doesn't kill you anymore, and so now you live with it. And now the rates of people living with these things go up. Huge late ticks, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism. All, these are, are 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 diseases that we never, I never heard of when I was a kid. Nobody ever knew about them. They were That's because un- you use the R slur to refer to the kid with autism, dude. Known, you know, to and any except for esoteric specialties in the in the medical profession. The um. The, the autoimmune diseases that suddenly exploded. I mean, most of my, or the, the great bulk of my followers are young people, and I do selfie lines after every speech, and they one at a time they come up to me and say, I have POTS, I have, you know, ADHD, I have all these autoimmune diseases. And Wait, I have all these right? autoimmune diseases? What the fuck is he talking about? Diabetes, lupus, Crohn's disease, things that we never heard of when I was a kid. Suddenly- yeah, nobody had lupus or Crohn's disease when you were, get the fuck out of here. Uh, first of all, he was rich, um, like, and <clears throat> rich, rich people, if their kids were sick with any of this stuff, they'd send them off to a fucking home. I'm not kidding. I think they did that to, it was his, his, his aunt. They sent her off to a fucking home because she had some kind of a illness or something. 
I forget. But they did hit. Well, I think it was his aunt. They did her dirty. Loaded, and and um, uh, and then all of these other, you know, the the autoimmune, the allergic diseases, the neurological diseases, and obesity. My uncle was president. Thirteen percent of kids were obese today. It's almost fifty percent. So you know, and that this is killing us as a country in so many ways. Not only national security and our ability to find people who will actually defend this who are you know oh, yeah that's right america fuck it we can't everybody too fat can't kill anybody in another country you fucking idiot enough to defend this country but the cost of it is 4.3 trillion a year so it is five times our defense budget we'll get to more on this in a moment first there, there's nothing like sitting back or rolls ben go for that five employers come slash is indeed Zipper group no. that. I mean, it sounds like tremendous regulation of the food industry. Well, that's not the way I would do it. I think that that's Wait, very what? hard to do. I, I think even if, you know, it ought to be. He's like, as president, I'm going to solve all these food related problems. But don't worry, we're not going to regulate the food industry. Oh, here we fucking come on. Through man. regulation. But Jesus politically, Christ. that because of the control that the food industry and, the uh, you know, big ag. The food industry and, you know, then the big companies that own them all, like BlackRock and the State Street and Vanguard, which own both the food processors that are poisoning us. And Wait, the, no, I don't uh, think that, I don't think that, I don't think that those, these are, these are, they may have, they may have investments in these companies, but like, no, they don't own all these companies. This is, this is a dumb conspiracy theory. Pharmaceutical companies that are making a killing on, on the disease and they, they all want to keep us sick. Uh, from a, just a pure financial incentive. And it's hard because they own Congress. They control the regulatory agencies. All those agencies are captured. But there's ways that you can do it. And the, the way that you do it is through good science. If you have good science, and, and that's why NIH will not study any of these diseases, the etiology of these diseases. NIH will not because they know and if they try to figure out what's causing the obesity epidemic, they're going to end up, you know, um, offending uh, high, the, the high fructose corn syrup industry. And Wait, what? Industry. No, all that shit about high fructose. Sugar is sugar is sugar for the most part. High fructose corn syrup is just more concentrated. That's all. And it doesn't taste as good in a Coca-Cola as cane sugar, in my opinion. Is that our... Um, that are so entrenched in our political system and our economic system and our financial system that, that you know, none of the regulatory agencies want to lift up that rock. What's causing the autism epidemic? What's causing the, op uh, the diabetes epidemic? And he all almost said the opioid epidemic. This allergic disease epidemic. They won't look at it. So, and if you're a co if you are a college researcher, and you try to do that research, NIH will shut you down. NIH controls the university systems because Wait, NIH has a $42 billion budget. It distributes that money to 56,000 scientists, most of whom are at American universities and the, and the medical schools. Right. Are, and the budget of NIH. I mean, who else? Who else is like, do you, mean, do you mean like research scientists? They're given research grants? I mean, why not just give the money to me instead? I'll do the science. I'm dumb as fuck. Budget those medical schools, so they have to comply. So they won't look. Nobody will look at this issue. But what I'm going to do as soon as I get in there, you're not going to get in there. Go down to NIH, and I'm going to say, you know, NIH when I Ben when I was a kid, NIH was ten minutes from my home. And I used to go there because I had friends who were scientists there. I was fascinated by what science. you just got to walk in. Like, what the fuck are you? I don't. Uh, first of all, I don't. I don't believe this is true. But if it is true, uh, privilege is nice, ain't it, friend? I guess when I was a kid, and I could go look at the rats and the mice and the guinea pigs and the monkeys. What the fuck? And no, you didn't. They all fucking clapped too, right? Uh, and uh, and the microscopes, etc. I got to look at the microscopes. They, when I, I got to go look at the microscopes at the NIH, that kind of makes me an expert, you know. The NIH was the gold standard scientific agency in the world. There were, in fact, you know, a lot of these new countries after World War II, 122 new countries were formed, and a lot of those 
were new democracies that were modeled on the U.S., but they didn't have the budget to have their own scientific agency. So they would say in their constitutions, um, anything approved by FDA or NIH is approved in our country. So the whole world was relying on our science. And with good reason, we had gold standard science at that time. Well, this is that Eric Weinstein, uh, Peter Thiel argument too, right? That scientific advancement has stopped and it has been captured since like the 80s or the late 70s or whatever but back before then it was it was the gold standard and it was all the smart people doing it is that this is that, is that same shit this keep this comes up over and over again a law called the uh, Bayh-Dole act and that law allowed NIH scientists and NIH as an agency to collect royalties on any new drug that it helped develop including the scientists who worked on that drug so for example the Moderna vaccine there are between four and six individuals at NIH who will get $150,000 a year as long, forever, as long as that mRNA technology is on the market. Okay. Uh, really? NIH owns half the patent, and they get 50%. So if you're a regulator working for these agencies, and you're making royalties, and you're paying for your mortgage, and your boat, and your alimony, and your kid's education based upon the performance of that drug in the marketplace because you helped develop it, um, it it tends to subvert the regulatory function of the agency because you have the regulators who are supposed to be looking for problems in that drug who are instead um, making sure they don't see any problems. So assuming that you can go in and clean out NIH and, oh, and restore so, yeah, decent... And I, I'll, 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 Ben's I'll, getting frustrated with the Ben's like a poor little Ben's like can't fuck man i can't be even the slightest bit rude to this guy and he just keeps rambling on about a bunch of bullshit i don't feel sorry for ben but it is it's interesting right what you do what i'm going to do is i'm going to redirect the science away that nih has now become the primary incubator for new pharmaceutical products and then it spends a lot of its time studying infectious disease doing gain of function studies and we see where that ends up etc well, where does that what end I'm up? I'm going to say to them is, look, we're going to give, mainly give infectious disease and drug development a little bit of a break for a couple of years, and we're going to find out what's causing the chronic disease epidemic in this country. Wait, what? And we're going to start. Um, uh, uh, people are living longer, and diagnosis of disease is getting better and better and better and better and better. There are other factors, but the, I think the, the two that I mentioned are going to be what you're going to find. Is on all of these, all of these, um, these injuries and linking. Them. We know there's an environmental toxin. You know, genes do not cause epidemics. Wait, what? They can provide a vulnerability, but you need an environmental toxin. All and, well, and you don't. And a no, you don't. Wait, product. no, you don't. I mean, an epidemic maybe, but an epidemic uh, assumes transmission. Uh, like I, I think an epidemic of like assumes that, that, that there's transmission of of the the pathogen or disease or whatever. But there are diseases that are like you're going to get them no matter what because you have some something in your genetics. Just called Phil Langigan, who looked at this issue and he said, you know, this problem began in 1989. In fact, EPA Congress. Uh, uh, yep, you know what? Fucking there. I'm fucking, I didn't know anybody with any. And nobody even got sick in 1988. What year did the autism epidemic begin? And EPA came back and said it's a red line, 1989. Well, a lot of these diseases exploded in 1989. So Phil Landrigan said, let's look at what it could be. And he said, you need a toxic exposure that became ubiquitous in 1989. It affected every demographic from Cubans and Key Biscayne to Inuit and Alaska. And that it has other characteristics for the neurological injuries affect boys at a four to one ratio to girls. So there's other kind of signals that you can look for. So he went through all of the exposures that began that year. I mean, all of the exposures that, that were followed that time, approximate timeline. And he came down with about 13 things. And there, you know, it's, it's predictable things. It's glyphosate, it's, you know, fluoride, glyphosate. Ah, that's great. No fluoride before 1989. It's a, an herbicide became ubiquitous at that time. Neonicotinoid pesticides, atrazine, aspartame, the, you know, the food uh, sweetener. Yeah, sweet and low. I think uh, there was sweet and low before 1989. 
uh, high fructose corn syrup. It was high fructose corn syrup for 1989. Radiation, um, PFOAs, PFASs. This is a class of what they call forever chemicals. I've litigated a lot on it. And they are, you know, they're in all of our, put around that timeline in all of our children's pajamas, furniture, et cetera. Wait, it was and put on so Landrigan came down with this list and said, it's got to be one of these things. It's well, no, no, but that's just, why, why does it have to be one of those things? Is it because some dude made a list of things? It must be one of them. I can make a list of things that happened in 1989, too. I think the grunge era, we could say, probably started in 1989. Did that cause all this? To do. But NIH won't let anybody do it. And what I'm going to do is do it. Once you figure it out, and you, once you have a threshold of scientific studies, of, you know, uh, of high-quality scientific studies, animal studies, bench studies, clinical studies, observational studies, epidemiological studies... Then you pass a threshold, a legal threshold called Daubert in the federal courts, and there is an analogous threshold in the state courts. That threshold says, until you have a certain critical mass of science, you cannot bring to a jury any claim that a certain exposure caused a certain injury. Once you have about 15 or 20 really good studies, then you set the lawyers loose. And if you have, you know, 15 studies. Well, we don't decide what's true in a court of law. It's like, it's it's an imperfect system that uh, uh, attempts to, endeavors to assign criminal and civil liability. It is not, is not an arbiter of truth in the way that he's sort of trying to suggest that it is here. Is a, is one of the major causes of the diabetes epidemic. And you have lawyers who can step in and say, I'm representing 10,000 kids who have juvenile diabetes and shouldn't, and we can litigate them. Now, people said to me, before we did the Monsanto cases, they said, you can never regulate glyphosate out of existence. It's too powerful. It's got Cargill and Monsanto and, you know, the whole Senate Agricultural Committee that it will, will go to the wall and die on that hill. But we were able you know, to win a $13 billion settlement, three judgments, you know, that ended up with this big settlement. Uh, we won three jury trials in San Francisco. The first one, $289 million. The second one, $89 million. The third one, we asked the jury for a billion, and they gave us $2.2 billion. Then Monsanto settled the case for $13 billion. We had, at that time, 40,000 cases. We were going to try one at a time. Monsanto also agreed to remove glyphosate from home gardening products. Mm-hmm. So you can get them to do it if you have the science side. Right. So, so, so obviously this is an issue on, that, on which you're really passionate. Another sort of existential issue or something you've discussed in existential terms, unless I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is climate change. Um, so well, what are your opinions on climate change? Obviously that is a hot button issue. Both well, let, let me just finish what I was saying, because there are a number of existential issues which are one of those is polarization in our country and you know they, they, this toxic polarization that has us at all each other's throat and nobody can really say particularly with the, the social media algorithms feeding on that and driving us further and further apart you know we have yeah, yeah but what's your position on climate change so divided since the american civil war that's another issue the the state of our soils is another existential issue um, that we're going to hit a wall with just in, so- in soil productivity, but a lot of other. Um, these are all issues that are ultimately the result of a corrupted system, a merger of state and corporate power. That no matter who the president is, these th- that capture, that corruption of our system is going to spit out bad policies on this issue, keep running up the debt, to keep destroying our soil, keep poisoning our children, keep the chronic disease epidemic, and no, with no, no, no way to solve it. That's why you can draw a vote for Trump and Biden. But you're going to get more of the same. We already knew they were both at four right, years. Right, right, right. You're not answering the tiny to answer Ben's question. And they didn't change any of these things. They're not able to avert these, this train that's coming at us from all these different directions. They won't even talk about it because those policies are the products 
of a corrupt system, and I have the capacity to fix that system. Right, so, so when you look at that system, I mean, obviously yeah. you're looking at a variety of, of areas in the Congress, but it seems like the vast majority of rulemaking and corruption that happens is actually not, I think, the, the kind of baseline theory that members of Congress are getting paid off as much as it is that you have a gigantic regulatory state where regulatory capture is really easy. The, the Congress people aren't even reading the bills. I mean, it's, it's, it's agencies or, or committees that are largely having these things written by outside lawyers or by outside forces. So you become president of the United States. What do you do about the size and scope of the executive branch? It's completely unwieldy. You have enormous numbers of people who are supposed experts in their particular fields. How do you clean that out? You do it one agency at a time. And I've sued almost all these agencies. I've sued NIH, CDC, FDA, EPA. I've sued USDA multiple times. Um, and, uh, and, you know, almost all these are the other agencies. I've sued everybody. That are, Vote for me. Are, that are the problem. <clears throat> when you sue them, you get a PhD in how to unravel corporate capture. Wait, and, no, you don't. You know, a lot of, they didn't start out corrupted. They started out idealistic. They started out models for the rest of the world. They started out serving the public interest, and they didn't always. Ah, do that fucking perfect. bullshit! This is nostalgia. This is just what he wants to believe about the past. Because bureaucracies make mistakes, um, but you can restore those cultures, and I can tell you how to do. It. You do it, and depending on which agency it is, you you do it in different ways. You you stop. The profiteering, FDA gets 50% of its budget from the pharmaceutical company. Of course, that's not going to work. Okay, and great. I, How, where are you going to get that money from? Should not be able to collect royalties. Um, the, the revolving doors that, that amplify, that put corporate capture on steroids. Right. But but does anybody remember the question was? The question was, uh, what's your position on climate change? Those, a lot of this I can do with executive order. There's also, in these agencies, there are... His <laughs> first executive order is going to be like, no more corruption. Corruption is now illegal. Tools ...at high levels who have corrupted them. And I'm not just talking about the agencies that I've sued, but also the CIA. Mike Pompeo, I had... The I CIA. Had Mike Pompeo the CIA that. doesn't give a fuck if you sue them. So, ...in Las Vegas, and he said to me... Um, he said, my one biggest regret in life is that I didn't clean up the CIA when I had a chance when I was running it. And he said, virtually the entire upper echelon of that. You try to do some version of cleaning up the CIA and your airplane ends up falling out a window. See, are made up of individuals who do not believe in the, in the democratic institutions of the United States of America. Now, my daughter-in-law, Emerilis Fox Kennedy, who's running my campaign, spent her career as a clandestine agent for the CIA. She says, yeah, that's right. There's 29,000 people who are employed by that agency, and most of them are patriots and good public servants. But the upper echelons... Oh, the, 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 the upper echelons, the upper echelons. Not The rest of them aren't all like assassins, spies, and criminals. It's just the upper echelon. Does he know what a, what the CIA does? They go to other countries and commit crimes, oftentimes under diplomatic cover. That's what the CIA does. By uh, the military industrial complex and people who would do its bidding. The same is true in NIH. When I sued um, Monsanto, when we sued Monsanto, we got discovery documents that showed that um, the head of the CIA, that's great. The CIA has actually has a plant inside of his campaign, and it's his fucking daughter-in-law. Ah, <laughs> uh, the CIA is sneaky. She's like, oh, I'll give you all the secrets of the CIA. Let me run your campaign. Has this <laughs> division at EPA for over a decade was a guy you called dumb Jess Roland, who was secretly working for Monsanto the entire time, and he was taking his orders from the highest... Uh, officials your months. campaign manager is i think not so secretly working for the cia sir Santo, to kill studies to fix studies to hire these bring in these phonies mercenary scientists we call them by ostitudes to ghost write studies and that he was the one that kept those studies his job was to make sure no study got done that would look at the links between Glyphosate and cancer. I can tell you who those individuals are at CDC. Colleen Boyle, Frank DiStefano. I know the names because I've dealt with them. 
I know who has to be moved. So they're on the record. Yeah, but, they're they're on the record about this, or you just know because you heard about you you met them at a hipster coffee shop. Like this goes, he's walking up pretty pretty close to the line of like uh, slander, a defamation, libel here. And you know, President Trump wanted to do this. President Trump came in saying, "I'm going to drain the swamp." But he didn't know how to do it. He's confronted by this big bureaucracy. And at every level of these, you know, some of these are... Six not only do you not know how to do it, he was just saying that to get elected. Working for these agencies. And at all the sort of higher levels of that bureaucracy, you have individuals who are capable of committing a civil disobedience that will turn off the lights somewhere, that will stop the sewage treatment plant. How does he he think they got up high in the bureaucracy? It's by playing ball with the bureaucracy. That's who's up there, is the people who operate well inside of that bureaucracy. They're not going to do, they're not going to be like, we shall overcome. They're not going to have a sit-in, dude. Get out of here. It's not fucking 60s. Shut up. And that will embarrass the president. So they tiptoe around these agencies and they never do anything about it because they don't know how to do it. But I know how. I know exactly what to do. And I know how to do it at a granular level. Now, when President Trump said he was going to drain the swamp, and he brings John Bolton in to run the, the NSA. So it, that's because he lied to everyone, you, you, you stupid motherfucker. He fucking lied to everyone because that's his that's how he does everything that is like putting a swamp creature in charge of draining the swamp he brought scott gottlieb and alex azar of a pharmaceutical lobbyist scott gottlieb is a business partner of pfizer president trump appoints him to run the fda and scott gottlieb gets in there does a hundred billion dollar favor for pfizer when it comes and to it regu- goes back to Pfizer, it goes well, back to well, when it comes to the paycheck. regulatory capture. I think that even President Trump would admit at this point that he would have to do a much better job in his second term with regard to staffing. But why do you give him a second of term course. if he's messed it up so badly the first time? He said he was going to do that the first time. If I had been president, I would have done it. He was able, and even when he knew what was wrong, he said, "Well, I'll never lock down this country." But he got rolled by his bureaucrats. I mean, I, I think that a lot of people who support President This country Trump wasn't locked down. Included, will believe that he got rolled by his own state. Yeah, and that's why 2020 was a disaster. We, we need but, somebody in there who will not get rolled by their bureaucrats. This is what my uncle, you know, when my uncle was president um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were 13 people on the XCOM committee who were, you know, living at the White House, including my father, who, 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 got a cot at the White House, and we didn't see him for 13 days. Even though we're only 14 minutes from the White House, my, my home at Hickory Hill. My father was there, and Bob McNamara, Dean Acheson, all the gray beards from the diplomatic court, um, and the, and the you know, Curtis LeMay, and, and Louis Lemon served from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So they were all meeting sometimes 24 hour a day, on and off. And the first time they voted, there was an 11, 13, 11 to 13 vote that we invade Cuba and we bombed the missile sites. There were 64 Russian missile sites that the Russians had secretly erected there. My uncle said to him, but are those war, are there warheads on the active warheads on that, those missiles? The CIA didn't know. And my uncle said, are the gun crews Cuban or are they Russian? The CIA said, we don't know, but we think they're Russian. How many people in the gun crews? Up to 600 on each gun crew. 64 gun crews. My uncle said, if we bomb them and kill all those Russians, isn't Khrushchev going to have to come to Berlin? And they said to him, we don't think he has the guts to do that. My uncle said, I'm not going to take that risk. Right, but that's he asked okay. The aerial photos, and he examined them himself. He went granular. I don't know the about last this. Day after the thirteenth day, this is the thirteenth. Like, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if. It, I don't know how how true all this is. It's dangerous days in history. There are many times during that period that I would imagine that the other people it. in the room, even the eleven or whatever that he said, were like in favor of doing some kind of military action. I would assume that they were a little less certain about like their recommendation than he's um and he's suggesting they they are they may wake up dead the next morning 
because a nuclear exchange would wipe out the East Coast. The last day my uncle took a vote, and he already knew what he was going to do with the embargo. He said, um, he, he took a vote. He said, this is the final vote. And they voted eight to six to invade. And my uncle said, the six is a habit. So he, he, what he was saying is, I'm listening to you. You're experts. I value your advice. But I'm going to make up my own mind about what's good, what's best for this country. I, I, I just don't I, like, President Trump. I don't know. <clears throat> are there like historical accounts of it going? Like, is he's fanficking this, right? Like, even if the majority of his advisors were against him or whatever, the, he's telling this story like it's fanfic in a way. It's like the it's narrative versus uh, like history versus historical facts. I'm not even sure I'm, I'm, I'm ex like explaining what I mean correctly. It's ver it's he's dramatizing it, right? He's writing a script. Does not have has shown that he doesn't have that capacity. Well, when it comes to deregulation and, and regulatory policy, that's one aspect. Of being <laughs> look at look a little Ben. Ben's like, uh, wait a minute. I think I asked you a question about regulation. <laughs> Poor little Ben getting steamrolled. And it's very important. You can't do nothing about it. His audience will get mad if he pushes back on RFK Jr. I said, when it comes to general policy, that's another aspect. And so I want to talk about some of your kind of general political policies, not just the implementation side, but but with regard to, say, things like climate change or tax policy. So you're the president of the United States. What does America's tax policy look like? Because the reality is that while we're talking about solving health problems that down the road and will have an impact on Medicaid or Medicare spending. The reality is that the tax burden on the United States is actually more progressive than it is in virtually any other country. It is very stacked on the top, much more than Europe. Europe actually has a much signif significantly higher tax base. The, 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 the base, the, the highest rate kicks in much lower in terms of income. In um, but in Europe, that's because you're, it's, you're paying for your, your health care. In Europe, it, uh, unless you mean to radically increase taxes on the middle class, for example, there is no way to continue to sustain the kind of spending that we're doing on into the future. There are really only two things that can be done. One is a massively booming economy, and the other is to raise the, the tax rates. When you look at the state of the American economy, what are the chief issues for you? What is it? What does a good tax policy look like? Well, my fucking uh, my uncle Ted Kennedy once said. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think we can cut a lot of costs. We can cut costs. We can cut our military budget almost in half. We can cut our military down to about five hundred billion a year. Okay, so explain. I mean, that. you probably can. I would. I would suggest there's probably outstanding commitments that don't allow you to do that right away. But I, I'm with that. Why? Why would we do that? Given the threats of China, given the threats of Russia, given an increasingly aggressive world. We, you know, we are the, our military. Um, expenditures and our our posturing around the world makes it a, a dangerous world. The the uh, the military industrial complex, which controls a lot of U.S. foreign policy, is looking for wars. You say Russia and China are aggressive, and you know I think clearly, particularly China wants to dominate the world. It doesn't want to do it in a hot war with us. China has one and a half bases around the world. Russia has two bases. We have 800. Yes, I mean, we, we, we have are 800. Bases. We have been in the post-war era, the global guarantor of, for example, but the post-war era. How long does that last? How long do we talk? Because he's talking about post-World War II. Well, anything that happens after World War, we're also in the fucking we're also in the post-Spanish-American War era, Ben. But have, but have we done that really? I mean, look, what's Since World War II, yes. Look, look what's happening in in uh First of all, they don't have freedom of speech in Europe anymore. I mean, look at the... the they, they have free expression laws that are not too dissimilar from our freedom of speech laws, unless he's talking about Germany specifically in there. It's just totally illegal to be a Nazi. Uh, I can see why the, the state might have an interest in, in that in uh, Germany. Now, that you, if you criticize an mRNA vaccine in Europe, you get a multi-million dollar fine. That's I mean, not freedom of speech. I mean, I certainly agree there are limitations on freedom of speech in Europe. Those are not comparable to freedom of speech limitations in China. I mean, in China, if you oppose the regime, you go to a gulag. Yeah, well, I'm not saying we should. Have, we should. Well, the gulag is Russia, but stop the Chinese system here. Right. And I, what I'm saying is, is, does China want a war with us? No, of course not. What they want, China wants economic domination in the world, and it. Well, they're doing it through manufacturing, through labor.
well, you don't have to like their government to understand that their labor force is the way that they are dominating the world economy. It's their labor force is the supply chain, obviously, but the supply chain relies on labor. That's how they're doing it. They're doing it through labor, dude. I mean, they're making stuff that other people want to buy. Everything in my fucking studio is made in China, probably. Is, and it's doing that by projection, by adopting the policy that my uncle John Kennedy thought that we should adopt, which is not to project military power, but which is counterproductive, uh, to project uh, economic power abroad. And Oh, uh, yes, JFK, famous for not wanting to project military power. The Chinese in doing that because they have done that. We've spent $8 trillion over the past 20 years bombing ports, bridges, schools, universities, hospitals. Here's what we got for it. For that, $4 trillion of that went to Iraq. Iraq is now worse off than we found it. No shit. Iraq, we killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. Iraq is now an incoherent collection of, of battling Shia and Sunni death squads. It is a proxy of Iran, which is exactly the foreign policy outcome that we were trying to prevent. God, what happened in Gaza with Hamas would never have happened if we hadn't destroyed Iraq in the first place because, because Saddam was, a, was the bulwark in that region against Iranian expansion, and now there is no bulwark. Now we have to send troops and put bases in Syria where we do not belong to make up for the, the vacuum we created by destroying Saddam Hussein. We created ISIS. That is not good for our national security. Well, and that's we, it's a little too it's a little too too simplified the idea that we particularly created uh, ISIS or the Islamic State or whatever. I have, it's more complicated than that. Started a war in Syria that drove four million refugees into Europe and destabilized every democracy in Europe and created almost certainly. Without that, Brexit wouldn't have happened. So. This, this is what we got for those military expenditures. Americans are less safe. The rise of BRICS means that the... Uh, I, th I think the, there'd be very few people who disagree at this point yeah. on the war in Iraq. But what I'm talking about is the situation but all the, all, right but, now. But what you're well, but that's to, because it's over, Ben. Little, little Ben, I bet little Ben was cheerleading the shit out of the war in Iraq when he was like... Fit, uh, what, how old was he? I don't know. Was defend these, you know, these huge military expenditures. What I'm saying is, they do not make us safer. Well, but th these are these are two separate issues. The use of the military and the military expenditures are not quite the same thing. Meaning, Ronald Reagan and and by the way, your uncle did pursue military buildup vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets. It's the deployments of the military that you're disagreeing with, not necessarily the military well, buildup. Well, no, what I would say is, if you got the weapons, you're going to use them. And you know, you look at the Ukraine, and you know, the, the well, well, wait a minute. Then now do guns. If you got the weapons, you're going to use them. Right now, do now do um now do uh personal gun ownership if you believe that oh you got the weapons you're going to use them well that means people who uh people who have uh who own guns are going to just use them by that logic and mitch mcconnell and you know a lot of the republican senators are now saying is they're saying don't worry we need the ukraine war because um our our weaponry was getting old and you know we we were inventorying in warehouses and we're unloading all that stuff on there so that we can make new stuff and that's, you know, that that is... I find that to be a foolish argument, well, but what I would ask you on... Listen, the I, I watch what's happening, and I see who owns all the military contractors who are who are making a profit, you know, north of Grumman, uh, um, Boeing, Lockheed, Lockheed Martin, Lockheed, yes, it, General we, we Dynamics. Companies, yes. They're all owned by BlackRock. No, they're not. BlackRock and Vanguard, like somebody said in chat earlier, they're like index funds. So they are going to be invested for their clients in all of these, in almost like any major company they're going to be invested in because that's what they do. They're index funds. They're, they're investment brokers. So BlackRock is now making a profit destroying Ukraine. And, and who got the contract? To be fair, BlackRock did not invade Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah, that's a good fucking look. Look, look a little Ben going, wait a minute. Only BlackRock invaded Ukraine. Good job, little Ben. And the, the question that I would ask is when it oh, comes but to why Ukraine, did, but, no, but, but why, why did we feel like that war, in my view, is a war about the expansion of NATO, our right to expand NATO into Ukraine, and was something that we but, but promised wait, but, that we... But that before, no, 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 that nobody, was, nobody wanted to do that. Everybody knew that would be a 
that like they, they didn't want it like even i don't even think Zelensky wanted that they, it was it would have it <clears throat> it turned everybody everybody involved was like this will turn up the temperature in a way that we don't want to do <clears throat> i i don't love nato but they're not stupid people who run it aren't stupid we would never do i mean that's that's factually untrue we did not actually promise the russians that we would never ex- expand nato well I mean, we did Gorb- gorbachev himself has said that this is not the case yeah well but, but there there have been all kinds of analyses that Damn. oh my god ben just told him this is factually untrue listen James I'm not a- suggesting that James Putin doesn't Aker, fear that. James Putin certainly Aker fears it. Admits that he told Gorbachev when Gorbachev said, "We, you know, the, the, the question is not whether we made the promise, Ben. The pro- whether when the Iron Curtain fell, there was some talk of Russia joining NATO. I don't know if people remember that. I don't think it was. I don't think it was like a likely thing that people thought was going to happen. But there was some talk of uh, Russia itself joining the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance. It was." memorialized in a proper writing that it was part of an understood agreement. It was an agreement at that time. He unified, Gorbachev allowed the unification of Germany under NATO, which was a huge concession for him that made it so. Well, he, he, he didn't was, have much uh, fucking choice, actually, because his fucking, the, the, his country fell. Like, does, does this not, does, does he not know what happened? Soviet Union dissolved. it collapsed when your country collapses you don't really yeah germany was going to reunify if the soviet union collapsed absolutely what did what did they what did, what else would happen would they just be like oh we're just going to keep it split in half actually loathed in russia ever since and the one thing he said is that to to uh, President Bush and James Baker and John Major at that time is I want your agreement that you'll never move NATO to I mean, the uh, east. Well, Gorbachev, Gorbachev has denied this, but but beyond that, the the real question is: Let's assume that all that's true. Let's assume this is about fear of Ukraine joining NATO. So first of all, Zelensky himself, when he was a comedian, made all sorts of shorts about the fact that NATO actually kept flirting with Ukraine. I agree the West's policy with regard to NATO and Ukraine was flirtatious, but it never reached the point of consummation, which is one of the big complaints in Ukraine, was sort of that Zelensky, believe it or not, before the war was actually sort of the, the left-wing peacenik version of, of the leadership in, in Ukraine. He, he was hit from the right before he actually was elected president of Ukraine. But even assuming all this, put it in and, and I'll I wonder what would happen to make him uh, uh, maybe not be able to be a peacenik. <laughs> He's like... Shit, they're invading my country. <laughs> it's kind of hard to remain a peacenik when you're a, when a nuclear superpower that's uh, on your border invades your country. Case for for the sake of argument, right now Russia has obvious control of huge sections of the Donbass. They retain control of Crimea. Is it in America's interest to withdraw aid to the point where Ukraine itself is in danger of Russian ingestion? Well, you know, uh, Gorbachev, as you point out. So yeah, can we talk about um, uh, present day? Can we talk about the present day? Um, and uh, in 2019 on the Minsk Accord, saying that he promised he was going to, he was a peacenik, and he wanted, and that he would sign the Minsk Accords. The Minsk Accords basically had three demands from the Russians that everybody agreed on to. The UK had agreed, Germany agreed, France agreed. The three things that that Putin wanted, and it's what not only Putin but the entire Kremlin leadership and and generations of leader back to 1992, not beginning with Putin, they wanted a guarantee of neutrality for Ukraine, which means keeping NATO out. Well, they wanted, th- then they invaded, friend. They, and then they invaded. Then they then they invaded, friend. A um uh, a, you know. A, a denazification of the government that we put in place in 2014 when we, we helped overthrow the elected government of the Ukraine, the CIA, and Victoria Nuland helped overthrow them and brought in five ministers who are, you know, uh, calling them ultra-nationalists is a polite description. And what? you you well know of the, you know, the, um, the, the, the Nazi history in Ukraine. And these five <laughs> no, Ben like, doesn't know that. He's a bad as Stephen, Stephen Bandera, etc. And the the last thing that he wanted was that protection for the ethnic Russian population of Dubai, of of uh, Donbass and Lugansk. 
who were being brutalized. 14,000 have, have been killed. And they, you know, the first thing that got, when we put the new government in in 2014, one of the first things it did, it did was to get rid of the Russian language. It used to have, a, you know, half the people. There's no question that, first of all, the Minsk Accords were extremely poorly written and violated extraordinarily on, on both sides of that particular agreement, including well, the by the Russians who put little green so men in Donbass and, and Crimea. But the, so again, this, this doesn't answer the question as to whether the United States, I don't really care about the internal politics of Ukraine well, nearly I, at I, all. I, I, the, I the question is, is it in the interest of the United States at this point, given the fact that Vladimir Putin has not really gotten back to the off ramp that I was pushing for, and I think you were both, we were both pushing for, I think, in the middle of 2022. Right, so it's Henry Kissinger, this sort of off ramp, let's get out of this war as fast as possible. In the yeah, even Henry Kissinger is like, we should stop killing people like that's that's some shit right the settlement that obviously goes by the wayside and so now we're in 2024 still discussing the, the war putin has not offered any sort of material off-ramp at this point to zelensky and zelensky has not opted to take any off-ramp so what is in america's interest if we if we well, you said it's just a, not true that's just not true wait what first of all the minsk accords although you know you can complain about uh, 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 about some of the language it was agreed upon by France, by Germany, by the UK, by, and, and Zelensky campaigned in 2019 on the promise that he was going to sign it and ratify it before the, before the parliament. Um, he was then, when he got in, he pivoted. The suspicion is that he pivoted for two reasons. One, his life was threatened by the ultra-rightists in his own government. And two, what? Victoria Nuland from the State Department said, we don't want peace with the Russians. In April of 2022. Like, but how do we know that any of this? Okay, well, like, this is like, like this is, this is, he's, this is full on fucking gish gallop. <clears throat> he's asked a question. He is not, does not directly answer the question and then starts making claims that I think it would take us a couple hours to get to the bottom, <coughs> to get to the bottom of the claims that he's making. It's an invasion of Crimea, which, by the way, my, my uncle, you know, was going to invade Cuba in 1962 because the Russians put missiles there. Well, well no, you just, I, but I wait a minute, didn't you just, Russians, wait, didn't you just a little while ago say that he did, did decide not, that everybody wanted to do that and then your uncle didn't do that? Dude, you're fucking contradicting yourself. Put missiles in Cuba because we had put missiles, Jupiter missiles in Turkey. So everybody knew that not, neither of our powers wanted nuclear missiles in our, uh, within range of our, our capital. And not only did we put missiles in Romania and Poland, Aegis missile systems, which are, you know, which are Tomahawk missiles, which are nuclear ready, Lock, Lockheed's uh, missiles. 12 minutes from the Kremlin, able to decapitate the entire Kremlin leadership, 12 minutes. Not only did we do that, Vaporizing. President Trump and his predecessor walked away from our two intermediate nuclear weapons treaties with the Soviet Union, with Russia. So we said to Russia, we're unilateral. Wait, <clears throat> did the United States walk away from those agreements or did both parties walk away from those agreements? walking away from these nuke treaties and we're putting nukes in your backyard what kind of message if they did that to us put them in mexico canada cuba we would invade now you know in, in terms of what putin's offer was putin putin only went into crimea after um after we reject after zelensky broke his promise and although well, the donbass and crimea were invaded in 2014 right right so that so in April of 2022, after after uh, after the invasion the, was February 2022. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, April 2022. Um, Zelensky, we will not help Zelensky negotiate a treaty with the Russians. So he goes to Erdogan in Turkey, and he goes to Naft Naftali Bennett from Israel. They negotiate essentially Minsk too, which does the same thing. Right. What, what now we know from Naftali Bennett, from Erdogan, from the nego Ukrainian negotiators, is that everybody, and from Putin himself, she talked about in the Tucker interview, is that everybody agreed to it. They initiated, both sides initialed that agreement. Putin was withdrawing his troops from Kiev when Biden sent Boris Johnson over to force 
Zelensky to tear up the agreement. Well, I mean, to be fair, that was also the same time that they walked into Bakhmut and saw the human rights violations, and that's the excuse that Zelensky used, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, but, 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 it was, but again, it, it, you're exactly, but that's, that's fine. No, that's, that's fine. That's again, the perfect I come back, to use, I, an excuse. That's all fine. I just come back to the right? same question. Is I, I, it in America's interest to let Russia walk into Kiev and take control of Ukraine? But I didn't say that. No, I, I, no I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not putting it in your mouth. It's a literal question. Oh, I don't think Russia wants to control Kiev. That was literally the purpose of the war. The original purpose of the war was to take Kiev. No. I mean, Putin, Putin made this, he, he tried to invade Kiev. They were in the outskirts of Kiev. They tried and, to land a helicopter. What, what he has said consistently is that we need to do this to keep NATO out. And he's got support of his own people. He's got support of the Kremlin. And what I said. Yeah, this is this is weird because he just keeps like. Not either, you know, him and uh, 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 all like of a, these. Like a, a better, a more adversarial interviewer would, would do a better job here because this guy's not. He hasn't answered. He hasn't given any straight answers to any of the questions. Comic book descriptions, which you, I know you're a really smart guy, and I don't know, you know, uh, how you end up endorsing this of the supervillains that were given every couple of No, he's a hardcore time. political realist. But Vladimir Putin is a hard power political real politic expert. He's Vladimir Putin has said repeatedly, I want to negotiate this. And, and Zelensky has passed a law in Ukraine. That says we can't negotiate. With Again, him. I've actively suggested as a solution that that Joe Biden go to Putin around Zelensky and negotiate a solution, and then make well, America aid to Ukraine. Okay, you and I, you and I agree on that. Okay, so but but until that point happens, until that negotiation, well, why, happens, why doesn't it happen tomorrow? I, I'll tell you what, it's going to happen the day I get into office. Okay, and it, let's assume that, that you go with Putin and you have a disagreement. Do you continue to fund Ukraine up to the point where agreement is reached? I, I'm, I, of course, you continue, but I'm not. I'm going to have a ceasefire. And I'm going to negotiate agreement. I'm not going to give ground until we have an agreement. Okay, fair enough. So that, that was the question. What? The, you can't give kind of a broader wait, you, you discussion. Can't, you can't. You can't. You don't have. You can't go give ground on behalf of another sovereign nation. You can't do it. Military. Yeah, no, I would never suggest that. I, I've been negotiating right. my whole life. I'm negotiating <laughs> 500 cases. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. First, you want to know what's stupid? Putting thingy and if something's yeah. What I come insurance quotes you how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. Yeah. So when, when, when it comes to American military policy, because you had suggested that we can sort of slash America's military budget in half. Yeah. And what I had said is that Russia is very aggressive on the world stage. China is obviously an aggressive player, not just with regard to its economy, but Taiwan obviously feels threatened. That's a very difficult place for the United States to defend. We do require a, a significantly more powerful Navy to maintain the, the seaways and waterways that allow for a, a free global market to occur. I mean, we're watching right now as a bunch of ragtag Houthis hold up half the shipping in the planet in the Red Sea because the American Navy has been unable or unwilling under President Biden to actually make sure that there's freedom of the seas in the Red Sea. When, when you look at, the, at the, ten, the, the terror tentacles of Iran, it's not that we should have bases we are unwilling to defend in places like Jordan or Syria. It is to say that a, a muscular American presence on the world stage has been a guarantor of world peace in a way that a, a reticent America and an isolationist minded America would not be. Somebody's going to fill the gap, in other words. Yeah, that's, that's I, mean, the purpose I, you know, I, I don't want to budget. repeat what I said about the cause of American uh, military uh, muscle flexing abroad, but, you know, it costs $8 trillion and we're worse off. We're, we're watching the rise of bricks. We, you know, we saw the destruction of, of um, Iraq, we saw the destruction of Europe because of America's bad military policy. So I don't agree with you. And, and you know, I don't I look at China very differently. I think China, we, we spent three times what China spends on our military. Um, they don't want a hot war with us. And by the way, the kind of strategy that you're talking about, but like a hot that, war with China or Russia, like, does he understand that it doesn't really matter? Like, how many planes or shit we have? We're just going to start shooting nukes at each other. Pushing dominance in the South China Sea, that's a 20th century strategy. You know, Iran does, and the Houthis don't have hypersonic missiles. We have 12 aircraft carrier, and that is the heart of our Navy, right? That, and the nuclear sub fleet mm -hmm. the 12 aircraft carrier china has two aircraft carriers and they're kind of older i think they got them from the russians but they um but the minute a hot war starts with china every one of our aircraft carriers is going to be at the bottom of the ocean 
This is what we don't, you know, this, right, of this course. is why NATO, we have to rethink NATO completely. We can't get a million people, uh, troops across the Atlantic anymore. No, it's... The, 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 they would all be sunk. The, the, the we question have is to not- understand the, 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 uh, the stringencies of modern warfare, of what it's going to look like. And that, that there's also... The only reason that we care about Taiwan is because of TSMC. Because, Correct. Right, because our my, the microchip capacity of yes, one. No, company, that's not the only reason. Which is, you know, which makes all the microchip in our refrigerators and our automobiles. TSMC does not make all of the chips. They are the biggest chip maker in the world, but they do not make all of the chips. There's global foundries. Intel has. Uh, Intel has fabs. And our F-35s, by the our, way. Right. Our missiles, our jets, everything. So, you know, militarily, we're really hurting if, if we don't have access. We can't replicate it. We're, you know, we're trying now, but we, we were not going to be it. It would take decades to get where the Taiwanese are right now. So that is, you know, so you can make an argument we, that Taiwan is absolutely critical national security asset for us, and we cannot let the Chinese invade. The thing is that there's another reality. Yeah, like somebody in chat mentioned, we we need uh, uh, Samsung has fabs. Is that um, the Chinese control with bases, the South China Sea, our nearest base is Guam, and. Um, and modern warfare with battleships and with, with um, you know, the domination by aircraft carrier, as we just talked about, is now a strategy that's very, very dubious, military strategy. But there are other reasons that China does not want to war about this. Number one, the Taiwanese don't want China there. And all of the engineers in that TSMC plant are going to do every, if the second that China looks like it's going to be, they're going to do everything in their power to get to the United States. So, you know, they're going to lose a lot of their capacity to innovate and to maintain the, the, the production of, of microchips. Number two. That, the, 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 there's the, the, the problem that Chinese, the Chinese companies rely on chips. Chinese companies that rely on the stuff from the TSMC fabs as well. Plan is not operating in a vacuum. The lasers that they use, the uh, they're all the different. They have a huge supply chain that they rely on, and the supply chain, a lot of it comes from Silicon Valley. Oh no, the IP. Some of the IP comes from Silicon Valley. The like, the, no, no, we're not. So we're not. We're we're not manufacturing much shit here right now comes from Amsterdam. A lot of it comes from the capitals all over Europe, and they can't function without that. So China can't just capture that plant and say, okay, we now run all the microchips. They're going to get hurt, too. Number three. Well, they probably also have to blow the plant up. Like, it's not not for nothing. You don't just walk in, right? Like a, a fucking... <clears throat> there might be people that would just sabotage the fucking plant if they thought the Chinese were coming. Who fucking knows what happens in this scenario? China dies without Walmart. You know, they, they, they're, they have a population that is on the edge of, of potential. Well, they made all these promises to them, and the only thing that is keeping them even up their nose above water is Walmart. And if they lose Wait, Walmart, I'm confused. They, they get hurt a lot more than we do. Finally, and this may be the most Walmart? important. Walmart? China dies in a week without Mideast oil. So we don't need to control the South China Sea. We, you know, to, 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 to dominate China. They can't get the oil to China without the shipping lanes open. And we are able to close those shipping lanes so we can literally strangle China. Oh, that doesn't require... The, 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 that, that, requires the, <clears throat> that requires the assumption that, that they're not going to start shooting. Uh, power, so, by the way. But, but, yes. but what I would say is what we should be thinking of is instead of a hot war with China, let's let's fight the war that China wants, which is by projecting economic power. But China, during the last 20 years that we've spent um, bombing bridges, ports, schools, churches, universities, mosques, etc., $8 trillion we spent on that enterprise. The Chinese spent $8 trillion building ports, building roads, building schools. I mean, he's right about this. With their Belt and Road program, 15 years ago, we were the largest creditor in every country in Latin America. Today, China is. 
on virtually all of them. In, in virtually all the of them. Tr- that means not all of them. In China. I mean, in Africa. Africa is now throwing out the U.S. military. And they're and they're and we and we've left behind all these kind of resentments, and they're embracing the Chinese. Oh, well, this is as good a place to stop as any. <clears throat> He's the 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 Gish gal up here is just amazing. It we watched about an hour of this. It, it would fucking take us till tomorrow night. All all of us, everybody watching right now, <clears throat> it would take us till tomorrow night to go through and pick apart everything that he has said so far. It would be impossible. It would be, it'd be fucking impossible. It's just claim after claim after claim after claim after claim. Some of it requires that you believe that he has insider knowledge because of who his family is. And that stuff's not even really fact checkable. Or if it is, it's very difficult to fact check. So <clears throat> Ben did a couple times tell him that what he said wasn't true, which I'm a little surprised at because I didn't think Ben was going to even do that. But he did. He did tell him a couple times, hey, what you said there isn't true. That's pretty cool. That's pretty uh, shocking, actually. Pretty surprising. <sighs> anyway, that's the uh, podcast. Podcast listeners, you can uh, get the whole show. If you don't feel like watching live and you're not crafty enough to go find the uh, another way to do it, you can get the whole show at patreon.com slash echoplex or at eplex.store. Just sign up either place at the $5 level or higher, and you get the uh, entire audio and video capture uh, direct to your inbox uh, the next morning. No, no, that would be the next afternoon. We're not going to lie about things here. And if you sign up at eplex.store, in addition to that, you get discounts on any of the items in our shop. Plus, some uh, we're working on some uh, member-exclusive stuff uh, for our fourth wall shop as well. So uh, I guess that's the show. Uh, everybody watching live, stick around. We're going into red light. We're going to continue watching horrible people talk about things. Um, and uh, I guess uh, podcast listeners, uh, that's that's all for you. This is Boomers by Periscope. I'm going to go change the uh, content of my beverage and obviously the color of the lights in here as would be implied by the name red light. I'll see everybody on the flip side.